singing that, you know, nothing else compares to the love of God to his purpose and power in our lives and in this world. And that's why when we worship, we sing about those truths and we come to his word. And I'm thrilled to introduce to you uh, a dear friend of mine. Uh, some of you know uh, who he is. Uh, he's back. He preached to us. At, I can't remember. COVID time confuses me. But last year or a year and a half ago, his name is Pastor John Kelly from Chicago West Bible Church. I could tell you about his ministry, about how smart he is, about how much he loves the word of God. I could go on and on about his uh, his character and his qualifications, but most of all, sometimes when you hear a guest preacher, you don't really know them. I've been in his home. He's been in my home. I know how much he loves his wife and family. I know how much he loves God, and I'm just thrilled uh, to introduce to you Pastor John Kelly and ask you to help me welcome John to our stage. Thank you, friend. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Good morning, Chapel Street. Good to be with you all this morning. Send you greetings from the west side. Uh, Chicago, and so good to be here with you all, and um, just thank you, Pastor Jeff and the leaders for uh, allowing me to come and preach God's Word. Uh, my family, we love Pastor Jeff, and uh, my kids, we were, they were supposed to come with me um, out here, but I had a stomach bug like a day or two ago, so I didn't know if I was going to even be able to make it, and um, they were so upset that they couldn't hang out with Pastor Jeff, and so my wife called me this morning. I was in the parking lot, and she was like, Ben wants to talk to you. And he was like, Dad, can we still come out there? I was like, well, the service is about to start. And, uh, but uh, we love uh, your pastor. And so good to be here with you. And it doesn't matter if I'm on the west side or out here that we're all family in Christ. Amen? Amen. Right? And uh, we all get to be in glory together one day. Amen? Amen. Still singing. And, uh, you know, I, I got maybe about 30 minutes in here to make uh, a loving appeal to you of what I think is probably one of the uh, big priorities in your life um, right now through the text that we're going to talk about. And it's um, being on mission for Christ where he has you. And this is probably right now in this season, a couple weeks after Easter, is where Christians tend to struggle. Easter comes around, it's like the tomb is empty, glory to God, everyone's singing, everyone's crying, we're all worshiping, and then Easter's over, and it's like, now what? And I think Christians, we have this disconnect that the grace that we sing about, that we've experienced um, from Christ, how we have been forgiven, we were sinners saved by grace, that that grace should transform us and change how we interact with people and how we approach this world. And what you're seeing right now is you're seeing the world going through a lot of issues, a lot of struggles, and Christians are arguing with one another, they're, they're not focused on mission, they're distracted, they're all over the place, and we forget that the grace that we profess, that we've experienced, the gospel we believe, is not truly shaping how we see the world and how we interact with people day to day. My prayer is that this, this morning would be a refresher. I know it has been for my soul to say, Lord, there's a lot of issues going on in our country and around the world, but help me to not be distracted and help me to move towards those who don't know you with the same tenderness and love and grace that I have experienced. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so I don't know what's going on in your week. I don't know what your schedule's been like. I don't know what you're battling. But I do pray that this would be a divine moment for us. We don't need another Sunday service. We don't need another podcast. We need to meet with Jesus and hear from him. You agree? So with that in mind, would you just bow your head in prayer? And I just want to pray that God would, would, would speak to us this morning. It wouldn't be Pastor John or Pastor Jeff or the worship team, but the Spirit would speak to us and open our eyes to see how God's grace should be moving and working in your life. Let's pray. Lord, I, I come before you with my brothers and sisters here and also those who might be watching online. God, we, we are sinners who have been saved by your grace. And you said there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. Um, but God, would you show us how walking in that truth that we've been loved by you and that we've experienced mercy and grace, how that should impact us as we go to work, as we care for our kids, our family, our grandkids, as we share the gospel with our neighbor. God, would the men and women in this room be truly transformed by the gospel and would it motivate and, and shape how we see the world and all the brokenness around us? Would you anoint this time? Would you bless the preaching of your word, and would you make our hearts sensitive to receive it? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have a copy of God's words, you could meet me in Romans, not Romans, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and the title of this morning's message is Transformed by the Grace of God, and that's the question I have for you. Have you truly been transformed by God's grace? 
Or are you still the same way that you were before you met Christ? The only difference now is maybe you go to church on Sunday. Have you truly been changed? And Paul points out three things about what it should look like in the life of a believer if they've truly allowed the gospel and the grace of God to change them. Some things should be evident. And here's the first thing that we see in, Rome, uh, in 2 Corinthians. Why do I keep saying Romans? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's the first thing if you're taking point, uh, jotting down notes and taking points. Grace enables us to see with God's perspective. Meaning that if you've been changed by God, that the grace that God works in your heart and mind allows you to see the world with his eyes. And so notice here in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 16, listen to what Paul says. He says, from now on, therefore, listen to this, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Let me just pause and park right there. And What's going on here in 2 Corinthians is um, Paul is being discredited. There's a lot of false teachers who are saying um, Paul can't preach. They talked about that in the, the, the chapters before. Um, he's not a good preacher. Um, he's not very charismatic. Um, he doesn't have a large following. All the extra stuff that nobody cares about, all the external stuff. And Paul says, you know what? I don't judge people by outer appearances. I used to. I even used to judge Christ by outer appearance. When, if you remember when Paul was Saul of Tarsus persecuting the church, if you asked him at the time, Paul, what do you think about Jesus he would, or Saul? He would say, well, Jesus is nothing but a hypocrite, an evil person who's trying to destroy the works of God and tear down the temple. That's what Jews thought back then until he met Jesus and was transformed and he realized the way he saw Jesus wasn't accurate. And so what Paul is saying here in this passage is, if we're going to be transformed by God's grace, it means we can't see people simply how they look on the outside, but we have to see them as souls, as men and women created in God's image. And I want to tell you, it's, it's easy for all of us in here to see people based upon their bank accounts, their degrees, their physical looks, their accomplishments. It's easy to see people based upon their sins, their jobs, who they, who they vote for. That's what we notice. They're all their external appearances. But Paul says those things are only external things. They don't matter in the big picture. And they're not always accurate concerning someone's true spiritual state. So a guy could be rich, wealthy, well-known, have a large platform, and be dark in the soul on the inside. You can vote for the right person. You can pay your taxes. And you can take care of your kids and still suffer from depression and be an alcoholic in the closet. So Paul says, I don't want to get caught up at looking at people from the outside. I want to see people with God's eyes, that there's a spiritual element to everything physical we see in this world, that there's a physical world we're a part of, but there's a spiritual realm that we can't see. And having God's eyes is being sensitive to spiritual things when we're looking out at everything we see on the news. The question I have to ask you this morning is, do you see people as God sees them? Do you see the world with God's eyes? Recently, my wife and I, we took um, our son, our youngest sons, Ben and Judah, to the Legoland in Schaumburg. I don't know if you've ever been there. Any parents or grandparents, you know what I'm talking about. So, our, you know, Ben's eight, Judah's six. They're all Legos, 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 everything Legos. And so we pay like an extra 40, 50 bucks for the, um, the 4D experience that they had there. And so it's like basically 3D, but you can feel the wind and the chairs move and it's like this. But the main thing is you have to put on the glasses to see everything. And so we go inside, there's maybe like 40 kids in there and the kids are next to me and Judah won't put his glasses on. And he's like, no, dad, it's scary, it's creepy. And, you know, I'm like, but Judah, you're not gonna be able to see what's going on the screen. All the kids are cheering, ooh and ah, and Judah won't put his glasses on. And so we, you know, he sits through the whole thing. We leave. Ben's like, that was amazing. Can we go again? And he's talking about what happened. And Judah has no clue what he's talking about because he didn't put the 3D glasses on. He couldn't see what was on the screen. What's the point? It's really hard to understand what's going on in the world when you're not willing to see with God's eyes. Like little kids who are too afraid or not desiring to put on the 3D glasses to see what's actually on the screen, so many of us really, we, we, we refuse to filter everything through the word of God and the heart of God when we watch the news, when we see all the violence in Chicago, when we see Republicans and Democrats arguing, we see racial tension, we, we see all the external stuff and we don't see the heart. We don't look with God's eyes. I want to say to you this morning that God's perspective is always right. This isn't, well, John, that's your opinion on this issue. No, no. 
This is spiritual clarity. God, what do you think about this situation? God, I know I might have blind spots. Give me your eyes on this. You know, there's a natural perspective that we have, and there's a spiritual perspective. God, help me to see the way that the enemy's at work in this. And what happens is if you can't see and you don't look at this world through God's eyes, you might end up fighting the wrong enemy. You got Christians fighting each other today. We're on the same team. It's like we can't even get out on the field to accomplish something for Christ because we're too busy in the locker room arguing. And then we wonder why the world doesn't want the gospel we preach. Who wants to go hang out with them? All they do is fight every five seconds. That's what, I mean, literally, that's, that's what Christians are known for. If you share your faith with your coworkers or your neighbors, ask them, in all honesty, what do you think about a Christian? They will say arrogant, self-righteous, and they fight just the way we do. What's so compelling about the grace that you're talking about? In Ephesians 6, 12, Paul says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. This is Paul telling the church in Ephesus, Hey, y'all, I know, I know there's a Caesar um, in Rome. There's, there's, there's Nero. There's the Roman authorities. There's all these different things in our day. There's people who are persecuting the church. But I want you to know Satan is at work in the midst of all this. Are you aware of that? We don't just fight against flesh and blood. We fight against spiritual forces in dark places. This ain't some Harry Potter book stuff. This is reality, that there's a spiritual realm. There's a devil that is real. There's demons that are real. This is not just some fake stuff in, this, in, in, in God's word. And Paul is like, we have to be sensitive to that. And that means that things like prayer matters. The reason our prayer lives is often so weak is because we see according to the flesh and not according to the spirit. We approach spiritual problems with physical weapons. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, Paul says, Though we walk in the flesh, this physical body, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, are not always natural. I don't always have natural physical weapons. I have spiritual weapons like prayer and faith in Christ. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of Christ and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Man, I I don't know. It seems like in America we just don't take the spiritual realm that real. I mean, every, all, every Christian around the world does, but we're just like, well, yeah, you know, we just classify it as something else. Paul is saying, no, there's a serious spiritual realm here at work. If you're not careful, you might get sucked into it and be used by the enemy. You can't vote away spiritual forces in dark places like it talks about in 2 Corinthians 10. Money can't pay off demonic activity. A degree won't defeat demons. If you remember in Mark chapter 9, Jesus' disciples is trying to heal someone, and they just can't get it done. And Jesus comes, and he heals the person, and they're like, well, Lord, how come we couldn't fix this problem? How come we couldn't fix this situation? And Jesus says in Mark 9, 29, he replied, this, can, this kind can only come out by prayer. Hey, I, I know what's going on with your dad. I know what's going on with your son. And it seems like he's walking farther and farther away from the Lord. And yes, he might need to go to therapy. And yes, he might need this or she might need that. But you know what they need? Prayer. Only, only prayer is going to break this situation. And so seeing with God's eyes doesn't just change how we see the world, beloved, but it also helps us to see what people can become in Christ. Look in verse 16 again, right? It says, from now on, Paul says, we regard no one according to the flesh. I'm not impressed by your job, your degree, where you live, how much money you make. I see you as a soul, an image bearer. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I love that Paul points that out. He says, if you're sitting here this morning and you're in Christ, the old has passed away. You're a new creation. You're changed. But for anyone that you look out the window and you say, you know what, that whole category, they're lost over there. Right? You got all type of people arguing and debating different points. Paul says God's eyes helps you to see that even though you don't agree with people over here, even though you don't like that person, even though your neighbor gets on your nerve, they have the potential to be a new creation in Christ if they meet Jesus. That means anyone 
at any moment can be changed no matter how they look right now. And it seems like we seem to have forgotten that. Like we just condemn anyone who doesn't hold the truth of scripture. And we forget that we were sinners saved by grace. Seeing with God's eyes allows you to see the supernatural and also allows you to see what people can become in Christ. I wish I would have learned this 20, 30 years ago. It's so easy to be harsh and critical when you see someone in their mess and forgetting that you started in the same place yourself. You weren't the smartest person when you were young. You didn't make all the best decisions. You knew what it was like to be rebellious. Man, you knew what it was like to be rebellious as a Christ, as a Christ follower. And yet when we see others in their mess, we don't see as a lost soul in desperate need of the grace of the gospel. We just see someone who we disagree with their viewpoints. They don't vote the way we do. Maybe they did something harsh and illegal that's worthy of putting them under the prison, but we forget. If not for the grace of God, there goes I. And so when you've been transformed by the grace of God, you have the ability to see from God's perspective now, and I pray that that would be your prayer as you navigate everything in our culture. God, give me your eyes. Give me your eyes. Give me your eyes. Help me to see. Give me your heart. Give me your mind before I start commenting on Facebook. Here's the second thing we learn about grace, that we've been transformed. Grace entrusts us, entrusts us with, the, with God's ministry of reconciliation. Grace entrusts us with God's ministry of reconciliation. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 18. All of this is from God, who, Christ, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Let's just pause there real quick. Paul says, this is what God is doing. Through Christ Jesus, what we celebrate on Easter Sunday, God reconciled me and you back to himself. And that he's entrusted to you and me a ministry called reconciliation. I don't know if you know, but God has a ministry and a program. You want to know what God's will is right now? Everybody's like, man, I want to know God's will. He's reconciling lost people to himself. People who felt like they didn't need him. People who trusted in their bank accounts and their good looks and their careers who feels like, I don't need Jesus. People who thought that their health was great and feel like they didn't need Jesus. People who looked at God and laughed. People who are rebellious, addicted, lost, rejecting the gospel. God's priority is to redeem them and reconcile them to himself. And he says here in verse 18, he has given us this ministry. Meaning, if you sit here today, this morning, and you believe in Jesus Christ, and you're like, man, that's my Savior, you got signed up for this ministry of reconciliation. You don't get a pass. You can't opt out of this. If you sit here under the sound of my voice, and you're a Christ follower, you are placed in this ministry now called the ministry of reconciliation. That's what it says here in verse 18. It's not what I think, it's what does the scripture say about us. So what is the word, what does reconciliation mean? I have it for you on the screen. It's the act of reestablishing friendly relations after a disagreement or enmity. That's reconciliation. We was on bad terms, we didn't talk, we wasn't cool. Everything may not be perfect like it was before, but now we're, we're back to being friendly after disagreement or having enmity, it means to make things right with one another. And notice what it says here in verse 18. If you look again, uh, this is all from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. That means you had a beef with God. You were God's enemy at one point. And we seem to forget this as we navigate this culture, that we were once enemies of God. Do you, do you understand? I mean, think about it. This is mind-blowing to think about this with Jesus. Jesus is the only one in existence outside of the angels who have never sinned and been in heaven, every person who went to heaven was first Jesus' enemy. He's the only person who died for everyone who said, crucify him. Like everyone who Christ died for was first his enemy. So don't talk to Jesus about enemies. And the self-righteousness in us doesn't put ourselves in that category. We're like, well, yeah, that's my cousin. Yeah, that's, that's the Democrats. Yeah, that's the Republicans. Yeah, that's the liberals. Yeah, that's the this person. How about that was me? I was far away from you, God. I didn't deserve your grace. And you died for me. 
Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? We were enemies of the cross. All and all who are not currently redeemed are still enemies of the cross. Yet God desires to reconcile with them through taking their sins upon himself like he did with us. And the instrument that he uses to communicate all the truth of what we just said is your mouth. Do you know that the means that God uses to reach the lost isn't just bringing people to church? It seems like that's Christians, that's everybody's evangelism method. I just got to get them to church and introduce them to the pastor. Just get them to church, get them to church. What if they never make it to church? Can you get them to your dinner table? That's the goal. Get them to your dinner table and share the gospel with them. And don't be fake. Tell them how hard the marriage was and how you came this close to divorce twice and how you battled depression and anxiety and how your life wasn't perfect and everything looked good on the outside, but you, you have Jesus and he keeps you grounded. That's what we're all called to do. We're called to dinner table ministry with people who don't look like us and don't think like us but desperately need the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are the instrument that God uses. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you don't see yourself that way. You think the best years of your life is in the past. I'm too old now. I got grandkids. I'm, you know, my health is not the best. Can you open your mouth and tell people about the God you just sung about? Are you willing to do that? Now, I know the problem is that there's some of you sitting here and you struggle with the word reconciliation. In your flesh, you don't like it. Reconciliation is a messy word. But hear me on this. If God is going to use you to be an instrument through which he works to reconcile people to himself, then that means, beloved, God is going to have to always place you in environments that are messy in which you see people's flesh and it's nasty. Christians always want people to come to faith in Christ, but we just don't want to deal with the mess. Nah, nah, nah. If your alcoholic brother is going to come to faith in Christ, you got to be around him. If your son or daughter is drifting farther and farther from the Lord, you can't. They're not going to, how are they going to hear unless you open your mouth and unless you show the love of Christ? And this is what I'm trying to get you to see here is that when we talk about being transformed by the grace of God, our witness in the public square isn't simply what we say and the gospel we preach, but it's also how we treat people. And that to me, beloved, is the big hiccup that Christians are struggling with right now. COVID has resurrected a lot of emotions and topics and things. There's been a lot going on the last four years. Whether it's politics, what's happening with George Floyd, you know, uh, 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 you know, all the different things that's going on in the media right now, wars, and Christians in the midst of this are arguing and fighting and, and going back and forth. We don't realize that God has called us to step into some mess. And how, the, not just the message we preach, but how we treat people is also a witness. Like you do recognize if people see you arguing back and forth on the comment section and social media and Facebook or Instagram, they immediately check out and they want nothing to do with that. You know, we deal with thousands of youth on the west side of Chicago. And most of the kids will tell you their grandmom or their aunt goes to church, auntie, my aunt goes to church. Yeah, I grew up, my grandmom always went to church. When you ask them why they don't want the gospel, because they see all their, uh, their, uh, those who are older than them as hypocrites. Yeah, my grandma went to church, but I saw how she would talk to my mom. Yeah, my uncle, yeah, my mom went to church, but you should, she was like a firecracker in the house all day long. You just, I mean, it, just, it was like walking on eggshells. See, it doesn't matter what you preach or what you tweet. It ma what matters is how you treat people in the process. And too often we don't talk as sinners saved by grace. We talk as Christians who were born righteous and always will be righteous. And the world calls that being self-righteous. And so Paul says here in verse 19, look at, look at this. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And listen below, here, jot it down, underline this. And entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. Paul says that you have been entrusted by God. 
this ministry of reconciliation, meaning you go to people who are distant from God and you appeal to them and say, be reconciled to God. I, was astray, I went astray as well. You know, what motivated Paul to keep going was the reality that every person who stoned him, every person who lied about him, beat him, robbed him, slandered him, and wounded him could be transformed by Christ just like he was through the message of the gospel. What are you saying, Pastor John? What I'm saying is you can't serve in the ministry of reconciliation if you're always combative and fighting the people of God, the people that God is seeking to redeem. You can't embrace this mantle of being a gospel-centered Christian consumed with reconciling the lost to Christ if the people that God is seeking to reconcile to himself you are constantly arguing with. I haven't seen people come to faith in Christ that way. Everyone enters the kingdom messy. We will never represent God well with hearts full of hatred. You know it's bad today. It's really bad when like you got to say to Christians, hey, you know it's okay to be kind and compassionate, right? Like, man, we in a dark spot, y'all. When you got to be like, hey, 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 brother, I know you don't agree, but you know you can still be like respectful a little bit. Dang. Like we in a bad place when you have to tell Christians things like that. If God is going to save some of the worst sinners in this world, he must bring them into your presence and be able to touch their wounds through you. And for some of you, you like, well, that explains my coworker in the cubicle next to me. I couldn't stand him. God wants to reach him. I know his mouth is crazy. I know he always says something inappropriate. But what if God really wants to use you to reach him? You know, everybody often talks and they, they, everybody likes this version of Pastor John. Pastor John wasn't always a pastor. 20 years ago, when I first met Christ, you know what I was 20 years? I was 20 years ago, I was a deadbeat dad that wouldn't take care of his kids. I was a guy that chose to have an abortion rather than man up and take care of the child that I was having. I was a man who was strung out on drugs and addiction, constantly stealing from family and people to support my high and a man who landed in prison because I was involved in a shooting in which someone lost their life. I met Christ in that prison cell and I haven't been the same since. If you would have knew me back then, you wouldn't have wanted to talk to me, you wouldn't be around me, you wouldn't trust me, you wouldn't want your kids around me. Convicted murderer sitting in prison cell in isolation, nothing good going for him. I met Jesus, haven't been the same since. Now here's the point. What if the person you can't stand right now, whoever comes to mind, is the next recipient of God's grace. What if that whole group of people that you just can't stand, what if that's the next wave of revival coming over there? Let me help you dig even further. Who is it in your life that leaves a bitter taste in your mouth? Their name comes up, you're just like, man, I don't got nothing for them. Maybe it's not a personal family member or someone that hurts you. Maybe, as I said, maybe as you look out in this world, you just see a group of people and say, man, they're leading our country astray. Do you think God can work over there? Like God telling Jonah to go to Nineveh, do you believe that I can have mercy on the people over there? Seeing with God's eyes and being entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation means that you are fully aware of the reality that God is seeking to transform his enemies through the cross of Christ. I don't want anyone to, I don't want to be a stumbling block of someone coming to the Savior because of how they interacted with me. When we're transformed by the grace of God, he entrusts to us the ministry of reconciliation. I mean, God will ask you about that. When you meet, when you meet Jesus face to face, yes, you will still go to heaven. Yes, you still will go to glory. He died for your sins on the cross, but he will ask you about the time he has given you, the opportunities he's given you the ministry of reconciliation that he's entrusted to you. You do recognize that when Jesus walked the earth, he constantly was putting people in a community that didn't like one another. I mean, can you imagine how Simon the Zealot and Peter must have felt when Jesus made Matthew the corrupt tax collector a disciple? You're really going to have them serving together? 
I mean, Jews hated tax collectors. They, they overcharged them and they oppressed them with the Romans. And yet Jesus sees Matthew and makes him one of the 12 disciples. Do you know how much tension that must have been? Talk about political tension. Be careful of shutting the door on someone else that Jesus is trying to let in because you don't have his eyes to see the way he sees. Here's the third and final thing. Grace, being transformed by grace, grace empowers us to represent God to others. So here we are, look at verse 20. Therefore, that means because of all of this, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, that's through us in this room. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It's amazing, of all the illustrations, of all the words that Paul could use to describe you, he uses the word an ambassador. What is an ambassador? An ambassador basically is an official representative of one, representative of one country who represents that country in another country. That's what an ambassador is. In fact, if you remember, you guys are from Chicago, you get it. I can't remember if it was like earlier this year or last year, but I remember one of the, the appointments of um, uh, Joe Biden, President Biden, he was trying to make former mayor Rahm Emanuel um, the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Japan. And basically every single person in Chicago was like, nope, nope, <laughs> that brother cannot represent us. Right, regardless of how you vote, but I remember it was like a big thing in the city, like I've never seen a city so unified on one political topic, and it was like, the one thing we can agree on is Rahm Emanuel cannot represent us in Japan, right? But here's the point. Even the point is, is he's supposed to go to Japan. I don't know if he is the ambassador, but an ambassador would go to Japan, and they're not from Japan. They might stay in Japan, but they're from America, and they represent American interests in Japan. They're here to represent the United States, Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ. So in order for you to be an effective ambassador, you must identify with your home country more than the foreign country that you're serving in. And our, our home country is heaven. Scriptures call us citizens of heaven, meaning this is way bigger than Republican and Democrats. This is bigger than the donkey and the elephant. This means that we all have voted for the lamb. We got a president that will never change. He's eternal in the heavenlies. Regardless of who gets voted for down here, our God is sovereign in control, and we lose sight of that. So many of us are cowering under the seas as if, like, as if God isn't in control. Can you see what's happening? Can you see what's happening? Yes, we can see what's happening, but I know that my Redeemer lives. And no matter how much we hear it, to be honest, this is where we struggle, brothers and sisters. We say all the time, yes, this world is not my home, yet we don't live like it. We put more trust in our bank account and our 401k than we do in Christ. We put more faith and trust in who gets elected than we do in Christ. We put more stock in what college we went to, what our degree says, more than we do in Christ. And Paul says, I don't look at the external experience. I look, at God, I look with God's eyes at this world, and I recognize that God has entrusted to me the ministry of reconciliation. So I see people as souls before I see them as who they vote for, their ethnicity, how much money they make. I see them as someone created an image of God who's not ready to meet Jesus right now. That's the reality. Don't let Satan bamboozle you and distract you to look at all the extra fluff stuff of who you vote for and all of this. No, it's deeper than that. God sees souls that are not ready to meet him right now. The last thing I want to happen is someone to pass away, be standing in front of Jesus, and, and all they can remember is, well, I sent John Kelly away. Well, all he did was argue with me in the comment sections. He never told me about Jesus. We just couldn't get over who we voted for. We couldn't, we couldn't agree on Christian nationalism or wokeism or all these different whatever isms they've come up with every year. We couldn't see eye to eye on this topic, but did he preach the gospel to you? No, he didn't share the gospel with me at all. In fact, we were arguing. Man, God forbid that's someone's story in Jesus' presence from their experience with me. You represent heaven. You represent the glories of God that you just sung about. Everything you just sung about this morning, you represent the reality of that to this world that is sinking like the Titanic. 
And when grace has truly transformed your heart and your mind, you embrace the reality that you are a heavenly representative to the sinful world and that God works through you. That's why Paul says in verse 20, look, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. That means God uh, is begging the lost, do not do not stay on this path. Repent and turn to me. And he begs through your mouth. And you don't get to choose who God reconciles with. You don't get to cherry pick. You can't be like, well, yeah, I'm going to talk to these folks over here, but I'm not going to talk to these folks over here. You can't cancel out certain people. So let me ask you a question again. Are you aware of the people that God is trying to bring to himself that are in your life right now? I mean, you know, when you walk out of here today and you get done hearing this message, you're gonna go back to your home, back to your job, back to your world. I will never meet those people, but you will see your neighbor every day. God placed you on that street for a reason, and it wasn't because you can afford the home and you like the school district. It was so that you can witness to your neighbor next door. Going to Target isn't just about going to get something from Target. It's being aware of the person at the cash register. Am I sensitive that this is a soul in front of me that needs to know Christ? Yes, she's having a bad day, and she seems to be very short with everyone who's in checkout, but this is a soul. Am I willing to be an ambassador to be salt and light? Your family, your friends, your neighbors, your enemy. And here's a question. Here's the litmus test for us this morning. What do they think about God based upon their encounters with you? That's a question you should chew on this week, oh professing Christian. God, what do people think about you based on their interactions with me? I don't want people to hate Jesus because of me. There's a generation that hates Jesus and it's because of their parents. It's because of the people they've been around. And so Paul says here, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, some translations say, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I pray you that you see Paul's heart right here. And let me just say for the record, Paul is saying this to people who are currently his enemies, people who are criticizing him in the church. Paul doesn't care about Jew, Gentile, male, female, circumcised, uncircumcised, he loves the global church and he wants to see every soul come to faith in Christ because he takes eternity very serious. The question is, do we take eternity very serious? As those entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation and as those who represent Christ on earth, what I would just say to you as you go about your week, we have to treat people like Christ died for them. Treat that image bearer like Christ died for them. That doesn't mean we don't speak truth. That doesn't mean we don't stand on the truth of God's word and we don't stand for righteousness in a corrupt generation. But what it means is we speak as sinners saved by grace, not as people who are cocky and have it all together. And as I said before, the problem that I think of our generation right now, what's happening is Christians are speaking the truth, but it's the way that they speak it that's turning everyone off. It's like we're, we're, we're coming with truth, but also with baseball bats, and it doesn't feel good. So has the grace of God changed you? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. When we have been transformed by the grace of God, we see with God's perspective. We are entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. And lastly, we are empowered to represent God to others. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray for my siblings in Christ in this room. I pray for my brothers and sisters here, God. You have placed them in homes, on particular streets, in certain jobs, to be salt and light, to be ambassadors. Open their eyes, Lord, to see that the fields are white for harvest. You said the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. God, would you forgive us? Forgive us for the times, Lord, we end up being combative or argumentative with the person that you've actually called us to witness to and share the gospel with. 
Forgive us, God, when you show us other people's mess. We see their flesh. We see their fallen state. And it's so quick to just cut them off and say, well, you know what? I don't want him coming around the family for Thanksgiving. It's easy to see someone's alcoholism or their drug addiction or how immature they can act and forget that, Lord, in your sight, that's a soul in need of redemption in Christ. It's easy for us, God, to be self-righteous and to forget who we are when we look in the mirror, that, God, apart from your grace, where will we be? Scripture says that, Lord, we love you because you first loved us. We're not sitting here in this room today because we're so great, we're so smart, we're so perfect, and we earned anything. We didn't earn anything. You were so compassionate. And God, if it wasn't for your grace, we probably would continue to wreck so much of our life right now. So God, would you give us a, a broken, tender heart for the loss around us? In an environment where so many people are divided, would we be people of peace? You said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. God, help us to be mediators, reconcilers, to step in the middle and to stand upon the truth of your word. And we don't have to apologize for the truth of your word, but as your word said about you, your word said that you were full of grace and truth. God, help us to be full of grace and truth. God, you're going to return soon. And there's a world, there's billions of people who are not ready to meet you. And so would you empower, would you equip, would you encourage my siblings this morning to shine brightly where they are and to not get distracted and get into the weeds, but to see people as souls that need to be saved, not simply their bank account or who they vote for, their skin color or where they live or what part of the city they're in or what their past is or what their sin struggle is, but a soul that needs Jesus. Help us, God, to be transformed by your grace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for letting me share God's word with you loved ones. Let's worship together now. For endless days, Pastor John began by telling us we'll praise God together someday forever. I look forward to that day when we'll all be together. Let me just say once again, thank you, brother, for preaching God's word to us. You're a gift to us and to me. Once more, a reminder, if you're, if you're new or like to check in and get to know some folks, stop by the kiosk. We'd love to connect with you after the service. If you're in need of prayer for any reason, uh, in our glass room right out there in the prayer room, there's members of the prayer team. We'd love to meet with you and encourage you through prayer. Pastor John, I'm sure, will be able to greet you as well down front after the service. Let me leave you with this. Brothers and sisters, go in the grace of Jesus, the great reconciler, who has called us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Go in his grace, power, and peace. Amen.